There's so much attention at the moment in the space on DeFi, decentralized finance, but what about real fi? Those projects are building on the blockchain and creating a real impact on people around the world. Empower is one of those projects. Glenn and Phil join me on this episode to talk all about their project and how it's going to have a real impact and allow for sustainable housing for millions and millions of people in Africa. They talk about the problems, the structural problems, the financial problems that happen in the, these various countries and how their platform can actually solve them. Also, some opportunities for you as well in regards to their token sale, which is coming right up. You have to go through the KYC process and I think it's only in two more days, so you don't have much time left. If you like this type of content, please give me that thumbs up, click subscribe, click on the notification bell and you hear more from me real soon. All right, let's get into this interview. Yeah, yeah, gotta do it like that. You've been listening to the Learn Cardano podcast. Gotta get I have Glenn and Phil joining me on this podcast episode to talk about their project called Empower. I have heard of this project before. I'm actually delegated to their stake pools for the ISPO, but I know I need to know more. I need to know a lot more to understand the project. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Great to be here, Pete. So, Glenn, let, let's start off a little about your backgrounds first so everyone can get an understanding of where you're coming from and how you're involved in the Cardano community. Glenn, could you start off first and give a little bit of background of how you got into Cardano and uh, when you all started? Sure. I, I'm, I'm a Cardano noob. Um, I actually uh, reached out at the beginning, beginning of this year, uh, last year, 2021, um, early on in 2021, um, really looking for a solution. Somebody had sort of said to me, have a look at Cardano, have a look at blockchain. It might be a potential solution to your challenge. Um, and uh, I got on to, you know, started getting into it and started the, the rabbit hole, going down the rabbit hole and got onto the Cardano forum. And part of that was, you know, I said, I've got this, we've got this challenge that we've got in Africa um, I'm looking for somebody who knows and understands the blockchain and can help, you know, help see if we can make this work. Um, and I met Phil there and um, was, a, you know, obviously Phil's Australian. So that was a challenge, but we got through that. And then we got to have a, have a, um, a relationship and started putting together the white, we worked together on the white paper and we drafted the white paper together. And so that's been the journey for me into the Cardano space. But I was running a, a, a fintech in Cape Town before that. So I come from a tech background, but always been involved in um, impact and utilizing technology to make a, a difference. Wow, very cool. And what about yourself, Phil? What's your background? How did you get into Cardano? So um, I'm probably a little over 20 years in, in IT, uh, I guess more conventional, uh, traditional, large-scale enterprise and um, corporate IT. Um, probably the last decade was spent um, uh, designing and uh, implementing um, large-scale software platforms. So you know, we're talking probably hundreds of thousands of concurrent users. So um, you know, it's that kind of um, experience that um, I'm bringing to the Empower project to hopefully uh, we can scale the Empower platform similarly. Um, but uh, I, I joined Cardano, the, the community in general, in about 2018. Um, and I've tried to get involved as much as possible um, with every possible thing that's ha been happening. I've um, been part of Catalyst since the very start. In fact, I was part of Fund Zero um, doing the, the proof concept of the mobile app that everyone's now using. And uh, I participated in the incentivized test net as well. So I've, I've tried to contribute to um, the project and, um, you know, help push it along as much as possible. Um, and obviously, ever since getting involved in Cardano and, and appreciating the community that we have, I've been always looking for um, a project that um, will obviously be uh, something that can be built on Cardano, but obviously also um, has impact because that's always been something that's been important to me um, throughout my entire career. Even though I've worked in traditional IT, I've always worked in in sectors that have, in my opinion, been um, giving to the community in some way rather than being extractive and not just a, a pure profit motivation. So, um, yeah, and obviously Glenn came along and uh, it struck all the right chords. And so here we are. 
And Empower is definitely something that can create an impact, uh, the sustainable housing in Africa. It's quite a mission that you guys got. What exactly is the problem and how on earth are you guys going to solve it with Empower? I think that the biggest issue around it is, is that there's a, fun, there's a 50 million housing backlog in Africa. So there's a backlog of 50 million homes. And the immediate assumption with that number is that it's poverty, you know, that there's no money. But that's not true. It's actually not poverty. It's structural. The issues are structural. Um, and it comes down to, to, you know, a number of issues. But one of the fundamental structural issues is the financial system because the financial systems are designed for first world applications and for first world users. And, you know, that was one of the things that attracted me to Kadana was the understanding from the community that, that that's what's wrong, you know, and that's what needs to be changed. And that's the whole process around what the technology can achieve. Um, and so it's a fundamental blockage on the financial systems and processes that prevents it. So, the mortgage system, if you like, you know, the traditional mortgage system in the, in the developed world works very simply. You have an ID, you have a proof of income. And once you do that, you can get yourself a mortgage. Now, in the developing world, neither of those uh, ha happen. You, you know, there isn't necessarily an ID. There's no record of income. Um, there's also the challenge of where, you know, the, the, the housing itself, the information on the housing the houses, the land, the property, the title deeds, et cetera. So there are a number of issues around that, but the structural issues are the challenge. So that's what we're attempting to solve with Empire. So it's really around how do we create a fundamentally new approach to the um, financing of housing in such a way that the traditional gatekeepers that have prevented that from happening, and it's not through, you know, through not necessarily lack of understanding, but it's the rules and regulations that apply that just don't work in the developing world. It's as simple as that. Yeah, we, we do take it for granted in developed countries, uh, all those uh, identi identities, uh, land title deeds and, and whatnot. So we, we just know that there's a system that's set up. Everything is working as it should. Uh, my ID, I can always get a new one if, if I need to. Um, but in all these developing countries, even war torn countries uh, where my parents came from in Vietnam, um, they don't have the titles for their, their homes back there. It's, it's gone. It was, it's all taken. Um, and they have nothing of, of that uh, previous country. So how on earth are you guys actually going to do it with Empower? Are, are you actually going to build these systems as well so that people can have identities? But it, more from the point of view. So what we're trying to do is utilize. So, yes, utilize what is there. You know, we're not trying to develop everything from scratch, but to utilize the processes that are already happening. So, yeah, the whole thing around it is, is exactly what you're saying. The traditional system works on, A, you need, a, you need an identity, but you also need a proof of income, which implies formality, which doesn't exist, because we know that most 70% of people are in the informal economy. So the thing around that is, is it, so everything looks retro, retroactively or retrospectively in the traditional world. And we need to be able to look forward. So it's how do we create mechanisms that allow us to look forward instead of looking backwards. So it's to cre create something to say, okay, if you're needing a house, you're looking at that, what does that look like? And how do we enable you to take that and then to build a reputation based on that through the, through the payment of, of a lease to own is effectively what we're doing instead of a mortgage. So we're turning things around. Okay, I'm trying to understand that. So at least lease to own is the term that you have there. So you 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 build and and you said that it's, it's you're going to do it in reverse. So can can you yeah. explain that a little bit more so that everyone can understand that concept? Yeah, so in a traditional mortgage, you buy the house, the bank lends you the money to buy that house and you own it effectively. I mean the bank owns it, but you you own it until such time as it is paid off. So that's based on the reputation. What we're doing is saying the developer effectively owns the home until such time it is paid off. So you lease it on that basis and through the building of reputation, ultimately you own that property, not the other way around. So it's around proof. So, in, so you're not risking that, that whole process of having to repossess the property, um, which is the biggest challenge because then you need the entire legal system to repossess the property. 
which implies all of those you know issues that we've just been talking about the gotcha. building blocks for a property system that we we assume work and we just we we just assume it because it functions but exactly that when it isn't there it doesn't work how do we ensure that people continue to pay build reputation so it's leased to own effectively because rental you know basically it, it, if somebody doesn't pay then they can move out and then you can structure it accordingly as opposed to ownership and then transfer and you know all of that complexity that goes with that gotcha totally understood now so you also mentioned reputation so people will be building a reputation and uh, I, I guess a, um, a credit history if they're renting these properties and they have some sort of identity and credit history from that so now people can actually see that they're earning something it's there's a paper trail are you building a system behind that as well yeah, it, it, that's, you know, part of it is, is managing the rental because that's a key part of what we're doing. So, so once that happens, the byproduct of that is somebody, you know, we know who they are and we know that they're paying their rent. That just by a byproduct, you know, is there. It's not the there main, it's, it's not the primary function of the platform, but it's yeah. um, something that is a, a happy side effect that they can then take yeah. this reputation that's recorded on the blockchain um, using a decentralized identity like Catala Prism or something like that. Um, and go to traditional finance and say, you know, that the current system doesn't support me tracking my credit because, you know, it, it, it doesn't recognize my income as a formal um, income or it doesn't recognize my identity. Um, so this is a, a trustless way of being able to build that reputation. Um, there, is a, there is another side to that reputation as well because I, I think the next question is um, if the developer still owns the property until the person has gone through the lease to own, um, then what about the reputation of the developer? So obviously the financing is coming from people through DeFi, through Cardano blockchain. Um, so there's a, a, a need to also have developers build reputation so that um, when people are choosing to fund projects that developers are doing, um, they know which are trusted. Um, and obviously that needs to be built up over time as well. Okay, so that, that was where I was going to go next in, in terms of my questioning. Uh, so we as a community, the Kidan community, be helping funding all this uh, housing and development. Um, and then do you guys, are you guys partnering with local developers to actually build these homes and, and whatnot throughout the, the various countries that you're working with? Yeah, and, and that's a, a fundamental and key part of, of this. We, we are building the platform to link, to link those who have funding to those who don't, um, the decentralized through a decentralized mechanism. That's effectively what we're doing, but we're not developing the properties ourselves. So the whole thing around that is, is we have to use the decentralized um, capabilities on the ground. You know, the complexities of property development on the ground is, is so diverse by city, let alone by country. Um, so if we look at the, that, we need to be able to use those skills and expertise that are available, um, support them and enable them and um, enable projects to be built from the bottom up. Again, that's a, fun, a key part around what, what we're looking at because historically, a lot of housing projects are very top down. So they have large projects that come in with big, you know, huge tickets of funding which obviously attracts massive, in the developing world, attracts massive corruption. Um, and so the whole thing around that is, is how do we build it from the bottom up? So you're building on a smaller basis from the bottom up the projects that are more um, practical and reasonable and built from the bottom up as opposed to the top down. Okay. So what kind of scale are you guys looking at in terms of building uh, in Africa, are, are you looking at uh, you know a couple of hundred homes? Are you looking at thousands of homes, hundreds of thousands of homes? Like uh, what, what's what type of number? Million, are you millions at? of homes. Millions. Yeah, I mean, as 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 Glenn suggested, there's a backlog of fifty million, and that's yeah. today. By the time we're able to scale this to the point where um, it can get to those kinds of numbers, there's obviously going to be a lot more because um, the urbanisation is is increasing as well. Um, so. Um, how that scalability will effectively work is um, we need to support the scaling of these types of businesses on the ground. So obviously that there aren't enough at the moment to meet demand and it's um, part of a vicious circle in as much as, well, they can't get financing. So they can't um, 
fulfil the backlog so they can't build a business and, and scale their own business. So um, it will take time before we can support the scaling of, of these types of businesses on the ground. Um, but also, uh, I think long term, the idea is, is that um, to be able to scale this solution, um, it can't have a middle a middleman. It can't have a, an empower team who is ensuring that all of the development partners are are trusted. You know, obviously in the short term that will be the model. So we, we already have a network of, of trusted partners um, that we can scale through existing industry reputation. But as more and more businesses um, start um, to uh, gain traction, um, then that reputation needs to be decentralized. We can't um, have somebody who's a gatekeeper saying, well, yes, this business is trustworthy, so we can have them build houses because we, we just can't do that and scale to millions of homes. Right. Okay. So there's uh, multiple aspects and faces to this. So there's one side where you're onboarding developers onto the platform, the ecosystem, and then the actual people that need the homes that will be leasing from the platform. Exactly. Bridging that all together in a decentralized way. Okay. All right. So that's. So we're, that's... we're, not, we're not building millions of homes. Um, we're enabling thousands of businesses to build millions of homes. Gotcha. Okay. That totally makes sense. How hard is this exactly to execute? Like, no. you, you... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's never been done before, has it? It's never been, never, never been done before. So, but, you know, um, somebody has to try. Yeah. Um, you know, and we believe that um, blockchain and DeFi is getting to a, a point in maturity. Um, and certainly Cardano is starting to build all the tools necessary to support this. You know, we talked about decentralized identities, which is a, a critical for um, managing reputation. Um, DeFi is, you know, still just really a very new concept, um, but they're all starting to come to a point now where, um, it's ready for this solution, um, but it's not going to be easy. <laughs> yeah, honest the uh, the great honest answer. All right. <laughs> so, where are you guys up to in the entire process? Then, like I know, and I've gone through and seen that you went through Project Catalyst. I think it was Fund Five, and you got funded through that. Um, you did a, a ISPO, uh, which a lot of uh, my own community members uh, actually got me onto. Um, I jumped in absolutely no research, delegated to the ISPO, uh, bought a an NFT. I think it's like a booster NFT. I actually still don't know how that particular thing works, um, but it's in the same wallet. So I'm assuming that's how it works. Can, can you tell everyone exactly where you're up to at the moment? Um, how are you doing the funding and those types of mechanisms at the moment as well? And probably tell me a little bit about the ISPO because obviously I don't know what I, I don't know what I've done. And that's really bad financial <laughs> advice. Always do your research beforehand. So um, the ISPO is ongoing, uh, and hopefully we don't have to explain to your community what an ISPO is. It sounds like if they put you onto it, then they already know what an ISPO is. Um, but um, it was actually um, out of community feedback. Uh, so we were originally just planning a, a traditional token sale, um, but we did get some feedback um, around looking for alternative ways um, to, to distribute the, the token. Um, so what you've referred to as the NFTs is our founding community NFTs. So um, what, we, what we needed to do as part of our commitment through uh, the Catalyst funding um, was do two things, was a proof of concept for the building of the houses um, so that people in the Cardano community could see that we were actually capable of delivering that. So we're saying, we're, we're telling people we can partner with people on the ground in Africa to build houses. And that's, that's great to say that, prove it. So that's what we've done. You know, we've partnered with somebody in Mozambique and we've delivered four houses. Wow, um, that's awesome. Yeah, um, and but also we um, wanted to demonstrate that the the NFT as a core part of what the platform will be, and we can obviously talk to that a little bit more um, later. Um, we needed to obviously prove that we could deliver NFTs as well. Um, so that's that was kind of the the reason behind the founding community the NFT was to a do a proof concept around an NFT, but also. Um, 
uh, I guess it was a a way of getting early adopters into the project to be recognised for um, helping bootstrap this project. Um, and so it was an NFT that, while it had a little bit of an artistic component, um, it was based off a canvas, which was also distributed free to all the NFT holders um, once it was complete. Um, its primary purpose was uh, as a utility NFT so that as the project continues, those holders of that NFT will get benefits, ongoing benefits. Um, cool. So the ISPO is is one of them. Um, the token sale is another, and there will be future benefits to the founding community and FT holders in the future as well. Great. I am glad I managed to get one. I actually love the the execution of it as well, because the, the first one I saw where it was a really large canvas all divided up into a grid, and you could choose a particular part of that canvas. And as slowly as people bought more and more of them, the actual image behind that canvas was uh, revealed and you can actually see what the artwork was. I, I thought that was an actual beautiful execution of it. So the bonus that the founding community NFT holders have in the ISPO is the majority. Um, they have what's referred to as just a community level um, NFT, which gives a 50% um, increase on the number of tokens um, that they receive in exchange for their ADA rewards. Um, there were 17% of them were randomly issued a, a, a level of, pr of um, premium. And this was just a, a random, nobody knew which were premium. Um, it was just luck of the draw when you picked one. Um, they get double, essentially, um, the rewards through the ISPO. Cool, I love that randomness. So you better, so you better check what level of nft you've got us to <laughs> <laughs> what kind of bonus you're getting in the ispo i'll check right after yeah you know, it, it's literally um we're, with a lot of the ispos it's a set and forget thing you, you load up a wallet uh, and away you go you know it's uh, funding the project and uh, you just just let it go but what is the token for obviously it's a, a race that you have ada and you can use it to to fund uh the project and build homes but on the flip side for the user what, what benefit does the user get from uh, earning the Empower token? So the Empower token will be essentially a, a utility token and it will have, um, obviously its primary function is to uh, be the, 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 the transfer of value through the platform. Um, so we're, we're talking about a global platform where we've got different people coming in at the top being the funding providers and it needing to be output to lots of different countries on the ground in Africa and maybe beyond Africa um, long term, um, in uh, different currencies that you know having to try and support lots of different currencies through the platform was obviously a, a complicated um, notion. Um, but one of the mechanisms that we're building is essentially a, a currency stabilisation process, whereby um, as the funding is issued through uh, the EMP token to the developers in the, in, in the different countries, um, they'll be locked um, as a, a, a collateral backing for a stable coin that will get issued. So um, obviously the stable coin um, that matches the, the native currency in the country where the house is being built, because obviously people are paying rent in their local currency. Um, and so as their rent is paid back, um, it will over time release those locked EMPs back to the NFT holders who were the ones that funded um, the project in the first place. So, that, so that's the, the, the main reason why we needed our own token for the platform because we needed to have a way of, of storing that value in the platform through that locking mechanism. Okay. So that, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. I saw a video on the website that explained um, uh, that whole thing as well. And I, I want to understand more that releasing the tokens back into uh, the token holders, uh, the ecosystem. So it gets locked in there as people pay their rent, it gets released back. Uh, what What's the mechanism behind that? How does that work? Is, is, um, uh, there are some uh, more terms that I saw in the video. Can you explain <laughs> that a little bit more? So um, this will obviously be a smart contract that will um, be locking and releasing. So as somebody... Um, pays back the stable coin for, for rent. And this is um, uh, at, at this point, we're looking at a, a 10 year lease to own um, process. So somebody will um, pay off the house over a 10 year period. 
um, they will um, pay in through that stable coin. And now that may not be them themselves. It might be the, the developer or a property manager who will do it on their behalf because obviously not everyone has access to a crypto wallet with stable coins. Um, so somebody may collect um, cash on the ground um, and then um, pay that into the platform. Um, the, the important part of that is that while they're doing that, they're also providing um, a, a, a decentralized identity um, that says this is the, the house that this is being paid on behalf of. The platform will then um, know which um, bundle, if you like, of EMP tokens um, that were originally locked um, is being paid to release um, and release that back to the, um, so it gets released to the NFT. So wherever the NFT lives, um, it will go back to. So the reason why we're doing this through the sale of NFTs, um, and we can, I guess, talk about the um, the, the the mechanism behind um it not being purely about financing um, and getting a return, but um, one of the technical reasons is because um, it gives the owner of that NFT a, a fractional ownership of the return for that house. And um, by having the return go back to the NFT, it means that they can liquidate their position at any point. They don't have to um, uh, find some other mechanism for um or they don't have to wait 10 years, essentially, because ultimately they would normally have to wait 10 years for all of their original investment to come back. If they say after five years, I want to liquidate my position right now, they can just sell that NFT and the person buying the NFT knows that it's still got another five years of return coming to it. Okay. So um, let me get this clear. So the <laughs> this NFT, it's not the founder NFT. It's another NFT no. that is purely a part of, uh, that's an indicator of the ownership of the property and rewards... Uh, not rewards, but um, I, I guess uh, the rental income returns goes, yep. returns goes back to that NFT um, to essentially increase its value. Well, it, it it will give back the original return of the the, the cost of the NFT in the first yep. place. So if I yep. purchase an, an NFT for a thousand dollars, which is maybe uh, one tenth of the value of the house that it's helping fund, um, then that thousand dollars plus um, some modest, more modest and, and um, acceptable interest rate will um, come back to that. So obviously, you know, we we see um, interest rates for mortgages of, you know, 20 to 30% in most co countries in Africa. So um, if we can still give people who are buying these NFTs a, you know, a modest return that's not um, being as extractive as the current interest rates are, um, then it's still worth it for that person. Um, but the other thing that we also want to build into these NFTs is um, another value proposition so that it's not just about the financial return, that the person may be interested in owning the NFT purely for the other value proposition that it might have. And if there is a financial return that comes back from the property, great. But if it doesn't, well, it's got other value to me anyway. So there might be some artistic value that we build in and there might be other uh, collectible um, attributes that we're going to build into the NFTs as well. So, you know, the, 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 what it will look like in the end um, is, you know, not completely decided and it, and it may vary over time as well as the community decide what is important to put into these NFTs. Um, but we're trying to decouple the, well, it's just purely about financial return um, and try and um, give value to people who are helping fund these houses um, through some other mechanism as well. Okay. All right. And just uh -huh. a, just a quick sorry, Pete. Just a quick point. I want to just we, we talked about ownership there briefly, and I just want to be clear that the NFT doesn't give ownership of the property. The, an important part around this is that we are enabling ownership of property for people on the ground. It's a key part about wealth creation. So we're talking about the financial model. So it's about return on the finances, not on the not an ownership of the property. So in other words. You, the NFT is the right to the return for a portion of that funding, not of the ownership of the property itself. I think yep. it's a key distinction that we need to make it's, because it's, too, it's, it's a... Yeah, I was just going to say it's too legally complex to have to try and um, give the NFT. And I know that there are projects that are looking at fractional ownership of property. Um, so it will come at some point in the future, but that's not what we're um, targeting because 
we want to be able to move quickly and trying to consider the legal landscape of every single African country um, is too complex, <laughs> way too yeah. complex. Uh, I wouldn't want to tackle uh, that hurdle either. Um, but I think the really important thing that uh, you mentioned throughout all that was that the interest rate is better than what they would possibly get at the mo most of the banks there. So it's it's something that it's a gateway for them to actually be able to, one, afford a home, but then have it, make it actually affordable as well. So it's it's a really a two pronged approach that actually makes it possible. Yeah, and that's very, very important because at the end of the day, that's why there are 600 mortgages in Mozambique in a country of 30 million people. Hang on. There are 600. 600. So 600 in a country of 30 right. million people. So that gives wow. you an no indication. No one can afford of, it because no one can afford it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But what, why are the interest rates so high? Is it is it purely a, a monetary, like a central bank kind of thing, or is it because of all of the structural processes that you talk about that make it so so much higher? Yeah, it's it's a mix of all of those. So so you know, it's part of that is 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 from a country perspective, mismanagement of countries. You know, so that's the whole thing. And and I love it when Charles talks about the accident of birth. You know, when Charles mm. Hoskinson says, you know, you, you're born, you have the accident of being born into a country that's mismanaged. So you are, <clears throat> you are destined for poverty for the rest of your life because, because some central government is mismanaging the economy. Um, and, you know, so it's that process that it's so, yeah, a lot of it is structural at a country level. And that's another reason for the value, you know, the value transfer is important for wow, in okay. terms of the EMP token. Um so it's at that level, but it's also at the, at, the financial, at the financial institution level. You know, a lot of these banks are incredibly profitable. You know, the banks in these countries are incredibly profitable. And so they don't have to go into this market. And it's complex. This market is complex. It's difficult. It's challenging. So it's much easier to do corporate lending, um, mm. or, you know, for large projects than it is to actually try and find solutions, particularly when we've got the challenges that we just mentioned earlier. You know, you've got these kinds of challenges that don't fit into the into Basel. You know, they just don't fit into that kind of structure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's it's that's the process. It's just so it's it's at a country level, it's at a financial institution level, and it's at a at a local level. So it just across the board is challenging, which is why we're so excited about the technology and the potential that it offers to actually for solutions to these really challenging issues. But with technology, you can streamline processes and optimize bits and pieces, so that way you can actually get uh, affordable housing and make it make it possible. Now, if if you're well, also trying to make millions and millions of homes across Africa, uh, there's there's that environmental impact of all these building resources, um, how much concrete you're going to pull up, uh, uh, trees cut down, bricks being being built, uh, made. Uh, at what kind of uh, environmental impact measures are you putting in place? Because uh, if you're going to do this and do it at scale and build millions and millions of homes, there's going to be an impact there too. Absolutely. And, and, and it's part of what we're seeking to drive because, as you can imagine, if you're looking at affordability, um, you know, the traditional systems and processes and, and technologies, building technologies, are already there. So all that's going to happen is that they're going to increase. So exactly what you say, if we continue to do that, we, we're going to replicate what happened in China, which for, as a global impact, it just is not possible to do that. You know, the, the globe wouldn't survive that. So it's very much what we, we're seeking to do. And as part of Project Catalyst, it's, we're very pleased with um, ready the impact that we've managed to have just through that process by just stimulating the discussion, by just stimulating the funding to be able to say, you know, affordable financing, but it's linked to improvement in, in environmental standards. So it's, it's, it's a link of those two. The caveat to that is that it has to be practical. So what we've tested with, within, um, within the Catalyst project is we've gone from, you know, small improvements to completely CO2 negative. So a, a whole new way of building. So, but we need to test the market because at the end of the day, it's still about the market. It has to be practical. It has to be sustainable. So, so we're testing that model just in Mozambique. So, so it's part of what we're wanting to do is to, to push the envelope all the time, 
but it has to be in a practical way that, that we're moving the market, we're moving the developers, we're encouraging and promoting, but, but it may or we're going to be constrained at the end of the day because for over 100 years, we've been saying to the traditional communities, your way of building, which ironically is, which is circular because it's, it utilizes local materials and can be done, but it's not terribly stable. So therefore, you know, bricks and concrete are the way to go. And we've been spreading that message for over 100 years and that becomes aspirational now. So a brick house is very aspirational. So people want, they want bricks, they want concrete houses. So part of that is how do we manage that process in terms of driving the environmental issues, you know, in, while the market is demanding that. So we have to, we have to move, move with that, but still encourage that. So one of the things that we've um, added to our tokenomics um, was an innovation fund. And um, part of the reason for having that, um, it's something that essentially be like a, a central treasury that will be topped up by the platform through transactions going through the platform. And the idea is it's almost like catalyst. It's like a, an empower specific catalyst where we want um, businesses who um, need to take a risk in innovating in this space um, to, to get some, some financing. So, um, you know, they'll be able to um, apply in a similar way to, to catalyst to the um, empower community to get funding and um, try different things, try new environmental build, building techniques um, in such a way that, you know, are not going to make it more expensive or are still going to be attractive to the, to the different markets. Um, so we're quite excited about that as well, because um, without that, um, it's going to be very difficult to, as you said, um, not destroy the planet in the process, um, but also, um, uh, I guess, help bootstrap a lot of these, you know, we, we talk about needing thousands of these companies on the ground. They don't exist at the moment. So, you know, we're going to need to help bootstrap those as well. So in terms of the actual tokens, you're having a token sale that's coming up soon. Uh, what's the process behind that? So a, a lot of people are staking at the moment for the um, the tokens itself, the uh, Empower tokens, but now you're having a token sale and what are you, how much are you trying to raise through that? How are people going to participate through it? Are you doing it through your own platform or are you doing it um, elsewhere through uh, another token sale platform? So um, one of the, I guess, the part of our, our core ethos is around empowerment. It's in the name. So um, we wanted to um, ensure that as many people could participate in our token sale as possible. Um, that was a, a very important criteria for us. And we felt that many of the launch pads currently are a little bit restrictive. Um, usually you have to um, hold the launch pad token to participate. Um, and, you know, how much you can get access to is based on on what you, you hold for that platform. Um, so... Um, we have decided to to build our own token sale dashboard. So we, we are doing our, our own uh, through our own platform, um, similar to how Will Mobile did, um, ran their own um, software to do their own um, token sale. Um, and so, yeah, the uh, the dates are over Glenn's shoulder there. Um, you can see. Uh, so we've 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 already started registrations. Uh, so they started last year. We um, we had on our roadmap that we would do the token sale in Q4 of 2021 um, and so we as we were getting closer to the Christmas period we said to our community look um, what would you think would be a suitable time for us to do our token sale um, obviously being a busy time during Christmas do you want to try and squeeze it in in Q4 just so that we meet the roadmap obligation or um, would you like to push it into January and so we had a community vote um, three different dates were um, put down as, as options to, to select from um, and the the twenty fourth was was the uh, the date that was selected, so um, yeah, so people can register now, um, and uh, on the twenty second there'll be a, I guess a queuing system similar to how World Mobile um, did theirs, where you go and um, specify how much you would like to purchase, and you go into a queue based on how soon you specify that, um, and then the first round will start on um, the twenty fourth. So we're doing three rounds, and. Um, Another reason why we also wanted to uh, do it ourselves as opposed to using a launch pad was because um, we wanted to be able to better control the minimum and maximum allocations. So the, the idea is to try and get this into as many people's 
um, wallets as possible. We want as many people to be participating. So um, our maximum allocation is actually quite low compared to a lot of other token sales. So um, across the three rounds, people can purchase 6,000 EMP tokens as a maximum, um, and the token sale um, price is 25 cents. So it's $1,500 is the most that anyone can purchase. Um, we have left a spot for a round four, um, which is in the event that we don't sell out from round three. Um, and at that point, we will give um, other people the opportunity who have already bought their maximum allocation to, to purchase more. Um, but obviously, by having a small maximum early on, it, it means as many people can participate as possible. And obviously, the opportunity has been there. If, if not as many people as we hope do participate, then um, others can can purchase the, the remaining tokens that are available. I do like the World Mobile approach in terms of uh, that um, uh, weekly process of sales. It was yeah. a very manageable process and you didn't have to rush for anything. It was quite a, a smooth, easy, relaxed, as opposed to all of these um, NFT sales at the moment. <laughs> uh, for, uh, it's, you know, you've got to be awake at a certain time and it's mad rush and they all sell out within a, a couple of seconds. Same with a lot of the other token raises for some other projects that uh, have um, released recently. Uh, they mm -hmm. sell out within you know, 10 minutes. And for me, and the website hasn't even, lo even loaded yet. <laughs> and we're doing the same thing where um, when the person's turn comes in the queue, they'll have a 24-hour window to purchase, Great. Um, you know, same as World Mobile because, you know, not everybody's, you know, watching their emails every minute of the day. So, you know, again, it's it's about empowerment. We want this to be as, as fair and equitable, equitable to as many people as possible. Now, you also mentioned um, uh, 1,500 maximum allocation for... Is that every week or in total per person? In total. So um, so in rounds one and two, um, the maximum Empower tokens that somebody can purchase is 1000 which is right. $250, $250. Um, it'll be purchased using ADA. Um, so obviously um, the, the, the amount of ADA that will need to be used will be calculated on the day um, based on the price of ADA. Um, so in round one and round two, it's 1,000 EMP tokens each or $250 each. And then in round three, it's 4,000 EMP tokens or 1,000 US dollars, um, which is what would make up the 1,500 US dollars in total. Gotcha. Understood. And with the, the price of ADA it is at the moment, it's, uh, hopefully it um, sustains its value. I think I think actually um, the reason why a lot of the community voted for the twenty uh, fourth was they wanted to give Ada a bit of an opportunity to get back up. <laughs> but um, yeah, well, I guess we'll see what happens. The most important thing, really, the message that we try to get out, and I think it, it has come across, hopefully, is that you know while we are very focused on impact and doing what we're seeking to achieve, this is a business opportunity. You know, and often that message can get a little bit lost in terms of because it's it, the, the philosophy is so much around building and, and empowering and creation of wealth. But in order for it to be sustainable, we believe that everybody has to, you know, it's in self-interest. Again, it's around self-interest. Yeah. So everybody must benefit. So this is about business. This is, so it's about business with a conscience and business with impact. It's not, this is not charity. And I think it's very important that that comes across um, you know, that that's what it's about. If you look at it, just what you were talking about, about millions of homes, should we achieve that? This will be very, very successful. Um, and, and one of the things, if you speak to any developer in, on the ground in Africa, any housing developer, they will tell you that there is almost an unlimited demand. If mm. the funding was affordable, there's unlimited demand. So it's really, you know, it's one of those markets and we're fishing in a market you know, people often say to me, yeah, but what about the banks? You know, that they're going to try and, and crush you. Well, we're actually fishing in a market that they've never fished. So we're not even competing with them. And it doesn't even sound like they want to. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic, hu huge market, potential market that is untapped. It's a massive business opportunity. And I think that's one of the messages that we really want to get, get across. It's a very exciting business opportunity. Okay. 50 million homes. It's definitely something to get behind. <laughs> it's a lot of uh, pent-up demand. 
in terms of actually engaging with you guys and finding out more information about Empower, what's the best way to get into contact with you, join the community and find out more information? Uh, the website has all the links, so empower with an A dot IO. Um, and so we've got a Discord server, we've got Telegram group, um, obviously Twitter um, is um, quite popular as well. So um, yeah, just jump on there. I mean, we, we actually had a, a Twitter spaces last night um, and uh, one of the questions um, was around, um, I guess, what we felt was one of the best uh, achievements to date. Um, and most of the team um, who responded um, talked about the community that we've built um, because it's been a very organically grown community. Um, and, you know, people who join the Telegram um, are quite often surprised at how, how nice everybody is and, <laughs> and, how, and how why is nobody talking about when moon or, you know, it's... Um, and so um, we feel that the community that's building out is um, a community of people who have the same values as what we're trying to achieve with Empower. And so, um, yeah, if if this um, rings true to you, the I guess the mission of Empower, then uh, you'll you'll really enjoy the community that we're we're starting to build out. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. It's been a pleasure learning more about Empower about yourselves as well and what you're trying to achieve. It's a, a very honorable mission that you're trying to, uh, trying to take on. Good luck with it. <laughs> I, I certainly you. don't want to want the stress of trying to ch uh, and, and challenge of this one. Yeah. Someone has to do right. it though. Someone has to do it. it exactly. Yeah. And if, if not us, then who? Hopefully you got a lot out of that interview. I certainly did. And I finally learned about every last little aspect of where, around what Empower actually does. Like I said in the interview, I got in quite early in the uh, initial state pool offering. I got one of their founder NFTs as well, but I had no idea about what the project was actually trying to achieve. And I'm glad I got them on the podcast to learn more about it. Hopefully you got a lot out of that too. All right. Make sure you check out the website for that token sale. You don't have much time left. It's a, a final stages of that KYC process. So you have to get verified before you can go into the token sale itself. So don't have much time for that. So get on that as quickly as possible if you want to participate in the uh, token sale. Okay, that's it for me from this podcast episode. If you like this type of content and you want to be kept up to date with more upcoming projects and things that are happening in the Kadana ecosystem, give me that thumbs up, click subscribe, notification bell, and you hear more great Cardano related content from me soon. Yeah, yeah, gotta do it like that. You've been listening to the Learn Cardano podcast. Gotta get it hype. Crypto is what we like. But this is not investment or financial advice. Gotta do your research, cause it's risky. We know it is. This show is educational and it's informative. Crypto's the future, really, it ain't no debate.